Okay, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. So thank you everyone for being here and thank you Maya and the rest of the organizers and Reyes and the rest of the organizers for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to come to San Sebastian. Usually when I come there is good weather, but somehow it failed this year, you know, and but I guess you know this motivates all of you to be here rather than on the beach, so it's also good. So I want to tell you, so I, I, I realized only a couple days ago that I'm supposed to give three lectures. So you know, that's um, what I decided I will tell you. The first two lectures will be about magic, angle graphene, and correlated physics in, in, in more heterostructures. And then the third lecture, I will tell you about um, topological insulators and 2D magnets and things you know, also related to the, to the subject of the workshop. Yeah, I don't know how to. It's OK. The next slides are going to be white background. So. This is just for fun, you know, the, the, for, so you can see the more air. But uh, please um, interrupt me and ask as many questions as you want, okay? I don't need to cover all the material, everything that I have prepared, and, and I'm happy to stop anytime. Just, you know, the important thing is that you, you, you get, you know, the basics. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I want to start, you know, because th this is a pretty broad audience, and because this is a summer school, I want to start, uh, if this thing ever works. Okay, let me see, yep. So I wanna start more generally with that discussion about you know, strongly correlated states of matter. You know, it happens, as, as you have heard also in some of the previous talks, that some of the most fascinating states of matter that we are aware of and that we know are uh, strongly correlated states of matter, okay? And this is something that happens, um, for example, in high energy physics, the quark gluon plasma, which is a state of matter that occurs a few nanoseconds or microseconds after the Big Bang and that we can recreate now in, in heavy ion collisions in accelerators. This is a strongly correlated state of matter. It also happens in the different phases of nuclear matter in neutron stars. This is a picture of a, of a neutron star in the middle there. And if you go to Wikipedia and you look at the neutron star, there are different phases. They are called nuclear pasta. So there's the spaghetti phase and the bucatini phase and, and you know, other phases, you know, as, as usual, the, the astrophysicists are much uh, better than the mother physicists at naming things, you know, so they really have an advantage both visually and in naming. And perhaps a bit closer to the, to the topic of, the, of this conference, and, and I'm, I think I'm gonna close this panel, hopefully, yep, is the fractional quantum hall states of matter, okay, where we know that, you know, due to the interaction between electrons, you can have very, you know, very strange things happening, such as fractionally, you know, charge excitations and all kinds of topological phenomena as, as, as Moti and, and, and Steve have been telling us about today. So when we, you know, a large fraction of the condensed matter community is working on strongly correlated quantum materials, okay? And here again, now the, the, the key players are the electrons and due to the interaction between electrons, we can have a variety of very exotic behaviors. You have, for example, systems such as heavy fermions where, you know, the, due to interaction between electrons, you can have effective masses of your electrons, which are hundreds or even thousands of times those of a you know, bare electron mass. This gives rise to very uh, unusual behavior, very you know, non-fermi liquid behavior, such as linear resistivity with temperature, for example, in this case. You have also quantum spin liquids, systems where your electron spins do not order even at you know, zero temperature, and they're constantly fluctuating, and they give rise to very interesting types of topological phenomena. And perhaps the most studied of the quantum materials are the high temperature superconductors. Okay, this is a, for, in this case, this is a, a phase diagram of the Kupret superconductors, where in a temperature versus doping phase diagram, you have a variety of phases, many of which we have a relatively poor understanding uh, even to this day. So just to, to go back, you know, um, to what we know about, you know, what single particle band theory tells us about you know, the electronic behavior of materials. Yeah? If you take single particle band theory, you can have essentially two types of behavior. Yeah? One is an insulator. If you plot the density of states versus energy, okay? so you have here one band. Here you have another band. There is a gap in between. If you have this band completely occupied, filled with electrons, and you have the next band completely empty of electrons, then the system is an insulator with an energy gap given by you know, the separation between these two bands. And it's very clear that this is an insulator because you do not have you know, 
at infinitesimally small energies, like temperature or voltage bias that you apply to your system, you don't have any empty electronic states, so you cannot excite your electrons there. You have to actually pay a big energy, this gap energy, to excite your electrons. So this system cannot conduct electricity at low temperature. If, on the other hand, you have a system where you, know, you have these same two set of bands, but, on, but your Fermi energy is sort of in the middle of a band, now you have at very small energies, yeah, accessible empty electronic states so that you know, thermally or when you apply a bias voltage, you can excite electrons into those empty states and therefore you can conduct electricity. So from the point of view of single particle band theory, more or less this is the picture what you have. A material is either an insulator if it has a completely occupied band, a com completely empty band, or a metal if one of the bands is partially filled. Okay? Now, when you introduce correlations between your electrons, you can have more complex types of behavior, okay? So for example, one thing that you can do is you can have a situation just such as this one, where your Fermi energy is in the middle of a band, but now due to electron-electron correlations, a gap opens, okay? So this gap opens and you turn into a situation where this band gets split into two bands. One of them is completely occupied, the other one is completely empty, so it's a behavior very similar to this one, Okay? And therefore, you have an insulated behavior, except that this gap is not a single particle gap, but it's due to interactions between your electrons. So there are you know, many types of correlated insulators. One of the most famous one is called the MOT insulator. Okay? So let me tell you in, in a sort of simple picture what the MOT insulator is. So let's imagine you have a lattice with atoms. Okay? Each of these atoms, let's imagine that you have only one orbital. So you can put two electrons, with a spin up or a spin down, in each of these atoms. Now let's imagine we put half as many electrons as we could put in this lattice, okay? So we put one electron in each of these atoms, okay? Now you can see that in principle, because I can put two electrons in each of these atoms, I can have transport, you know, and this electron can just go from here, jump from here to here to here to here to here, and conduct electricity. You expect this to be a metal, okay? However, if you include strong, you know, so in a process such as this, okay? However, if you include electron-electron interactions, and there's materials where these electron-electron interactions are very strong, it takes a lot of energy to occupy with two electrons one of these sites, okay? This energy cost, which we call U, okay, means that no double occupancy is allowed. And therefore, your electrons are all stuck in their position, and you cannot have transport through your system, okay? So you get a situation which is exactly like the one that I plotted before. You put half as many electrons as you could put in this band. The system, all the electrons get blocked. Okay? There is a splitting here, a gap, which is a correlated gap, and this turns out to be an insulator. Now, why are MOT insulators so famous? Okay? So they're partly so famous because they are believed to be the parent compound for high temperature cuprate superconductors. So in high temperature cuprate superconductors, there are these copper oxygen planes. And for the parent compound, what you have is one electron per copper site, okay? And this thing turns out to be an insulator, a mode insulator, due to strong correlations. Now, an interesting thing happens when you take away a few electrons from the lattice, okay? So when you dope with holes, when you take a few electrons, now these electrons can jump from side to side, okay? And interesting things happen, such as, you know, high temperature superconductivity, etc. Now, the basic model that is believed to describe the essence, okay, essential physics of cuprate superconductors is this Hubbard model, okay? Now, despite more than, you know, 30, 40 years, you know, that this model exists, there is still relatively little understanding about how exactly we go from this model to this phase diagram that I showed before, and that is because this Hubbard model cannot be calculated exactly theoretically. Okay? You have to make approximations, and then depending on what approximations you make, then you get you know, one thing or another, and there's basically no agreement, you know, no substantial agreement on how do we go from here to here you know, among the theoretical community. Now, the fact that there is, you know, this is so difficult to, to sort of solve this problem theoretically has led to many alternative approaches to study physics of strongly correlated systems. Okay? One of the most Perhaps one of the most innovative or one of the, you know, those that I think is, is most interesting is that of investigating strongly correlated physics using ultra-cold atoms in optical lattices, okay? So 
This is something that you know, was already done, you know, it's been going on for, for maybe 17 years or so. The first realization was, was this one, if you, if you make a periodic, if you shine two lasers at each other, actually four lasers to make a 2D lattice. Okay? You make a periodic potential for atoms, you can load that lattice, optical lattice with atoms, and it turns out that you can tune the interaction between those atoms. Okay? This is something, you know, the, the AMO people have a lot of control over this. So already, you know, the group of Immanuel Bloch and, and you know, led by that experiment by Marcus Greiner in 2002, they were able to realize a superfluid to mode insulator transition, you know, by tuning the interaction strength between those atoms. Now, this is something that was done with bosonic atoms. So it was a realization of the Bose-Hubba model. A few years later, people were able to do this with fermionic atoms, so they did the Fermi-Hubba model. And just to give you an idea of what is the state of the art, okay, people have been recently able to realize anti-ferromagnetism in the fermi hubbard model, several papers, okay? So we, we, you, you can load your optical lattice with, with fermionic atoms, and now you can cool down, and you can see that at zero doping, you get short-range anti-ferromagnetism. Now, this means that with this, you know, ultra-cold atoms, we're beginning to explore, or people are beginning to explore this corner of the phase diagram, okay? Mot, they go a little bit into ferromagnetism. They would like to explore the entire phase diagram, and in particular, this interesting region of, of D wave superfluidity in the case of atoms. However, in order to do so, they need to cool down very substantially you know, below what they have now. They're already at a nano Kelvin, and they have to <coughs> cool down to a fraction of a nano Kelvin in order to explore this physics. And while there are no fundamental obstacles towards this, it is actually quite technically very you know, challenging. So we have these you know, two platforms to, you know, to study strongly correlated physics. We have actual quantum materials with typical lattice scales of, of the order of an Armstrong. We have cold atoms in optical lattices with typical scales, length scales of one micron. And I, what I want to tell you about today and also the first lecture tomorrow is that the second lecture tomorrow is about this new platform, magic angle graphene, and it actually goes beyond graphene. This is a more general concept where typical energy uh, lattice scales are of order 10 nanometers or so. Now, associated with these length scales, you also have energy scales. So in typical quantum materials, your energy scale is of the order of 100 Kelvin or 1,000 Kelvin, depending what you're looking at. In cold atoms, typical energy scale is of order of nano Kelvin. In graphene, as I will mention, typical energy scale is of order 1 Kelvin, 10 Kelvin, okay? So because we have about a factor 100 in length from either of these, we also have an intermediate energy scale associated with the phenomena that we're looking at. So this is the outline of what I want to tell you about today and, and also tomorrow during the second lecture. I'll mention a little bit about 2D materials, Ligoland, Twistronics, and other you know, terms that people use nowadays to, to describe these systems. I'll tell you a little bit about graphene and magic angle graphene super lattices. I'll tell you about our observation of correlated insulated behavior and superconductivity. And then uh, tomorrow, I'll tell you about Outlook and, and you know, some of the latest experiments and what, uh, you know, latest developments by you know, several groups in the field. So, you know, in, you know, one of, you know we've been having a lot of fun with, with 2D materials now for you know, maybe 15 years or so since the isolation of, of graphene in 2004 by, by the Manchester group. And initially, it was all about studying graphene. You know, it was a new system, and we had a lot of fun, interesting ultra-relativistic properties. Now, after a few years, people realized, well, it's not just graphene. We can actually, there are other 2D materials that exist around, and people started to study other 2D materials. Then people thought, oh, we can actually put them on top of each other and make you know, new heterostructures. So soon this led to analogies with, with, with Legoland, you know, with, with Lego blocks, where one of the things one of the characteristics that make 2D materials so special is the fact that you can stack anything on top of anything. Okay? This is not easy to do with, with MB uh, grown you know, heterostructures because you usually have constraints in terms of chemical compatibility or lattice you know, strain, etc. With 2D materials, you can pretty much put anything on top of anything at will. Now, so, you know, so my, my friends and colleagues you know, wrote these reviews making analogies with Lego. Now, I would argue that this analogy is not as good as it 
yeah, as it could be. You know, uh, the, perhaps the most unique aspect of, of 2D material is not the fact that you can make it Lego-like. You know? After all, you know, if, if you have played with Lego pieces, you know, I have small kids, so I play with Lego all the time. And often my, you know, my small son or my daughter comes and says like, Daddy, I can't stack this on top of the other one, right? And this is because, as you know, Lego pieces have to be perfectly aligned in order to stack them on top of each other. Yeah? Only then you can make a Lego heterostructure. So I would argue that the most unique aspect of 2D materials, this Lego, this Lego aspect is very important, but the most unique aspect of 2D materials is the fact that we can make this. We can stack two 2D materials with any arbitrary angle of rotation between the two lattices, any that we want. It can be 37 degrees, 51, 1.1, as I will show, any angle that we want. That has no precedence in the history of material science, that ability to tune as a knob, the angle of rotation between two crystalline lattices. And as I'm gonna show you, this can lead to dramatic consequences in terms of the electronic properties, but also optical, mechanical, etc. So let me stop this before you get dizzy. So let me show you a little bit about graphene, uh, tell you a little bit about graphene and magic angle graphene. So graphene is, is a honeycomb of carbon atoms. I think it's mentioned by, by you know, several of the lecturers before. Now this honeycomb, even though all of the atoms here are carbon and they are chemically identical, they are crystallographically inequivalent. Okay? Graphene is a hexagonal lattice with a two atom basis. We call them usually the A atoms and the B atoms, even though they are both carbon. Okay? Now, you can calculate in a simple, you know, using a simple tight binding model, what is the energy versus momentum for electrons in graphene, okay, into dimensions. And you see that it has this very unusual, you know, when you zoom in near the Fermi energy, it has this very unusual conical band structure, okay, where you have electrons here, holes here, and there is a zero gap. Okay, graphene is a semi-metal with a zero gap. Now, this unusual linear band structure has led to all kinds of analogies with the behavior of electrons in graphene and uh, the behavior of massless ultra-relativistic particles, okay? In fact, you know, the Hamiltonian equation that describes this behavior is just here, you know, its energy is linear in K, now, in the usual Dirac equation in two dimensions, this is a spinner which represents the spin up and down of the electron. In the case of graphene, this represents whether your, the weight of your electron wave function is on the A or B sublattice. Yeah? Now, another thing that it's, you know, that it's gonna appear in, in, in the rest of my talk is that the fact that we have in graphene fourfold degeneracy. That means electrons have spin up and spin down degeneracy. In addition, they have K and K prime degeneracy because there are two inequivalent such valleys, okay, in the Brillouin zone of graphene. So just remember four, okay? Now, what happens if you put graphene on top of graphene? Okay? So if you put graphene on top of graphene and now you rotate the angle, a moiré pattern forms, okay? And the moiré wavelength, the distance between the soccer balls that you see here, okay, changes with the twist angle, with the angle of rotation, okay? Now, that more wavelength can go all the way to infinity because these two lattices are identical, okay? If they were not identical, there would be a maximum more wavelength, but because these two lattices are identical, the more wavelength can be very, very large. Now, this is what happens in real space. Let's look at what happens in momentum space and therefore what happens to the electronic structure of the system. So, here we have graphene, okay? This is graphene band structure, this is the Dirac cones, this is the you know, reciprocal space, momentum space, okay? These are the Fermi disks if your Fermi energy is at some finite value, okay? Now let's put another graphene sheet on top. If we put the graphene sheets on top, the reciprocal spaces also fall on top of each other, okay? And if we now rotate by an angle in reciprocal space, sorry, in real space, the reciprocal space rotates by the same angle, okay? This means that the graphene, that the Dirac cones of the two graphene sheets, okay, here red means one graphene sheet, blue means the other graphene sheet, the Dirac cones of the two graphene sheets get separated, become separated in momentum space by a, you know, momentum which is proportional to the sine of half the angle, okay? So twisting leads to layer Dirac cones separated in momentum space. Let's start now from a small, relatively small twist angle and let go, let's go towards smaller and smaller and smaller angles and see what happens. Okay? So, if we start from a small angle, the sine of the angle is proportional to the angle, okay? So this is the situation that could occur, these two interpenetrating Dirac cones, if there was no coupling between the two graphene sheets. Okay? 
If electrons in one graphene sheet did not know that the other graphene sheet exists. But electrons in one graphene sheet are very much aware that the other graphene sheet exists. They can tunnel to it because it's only three angstroms apart. Okay? So you, what you actually have is this. You have here level repulsion. At the point where those two Dirac codes cross, you have level repulsion. This is the same thing as bonding, anti-bonding state in a hydrogen molecule. Okay? The exact same thing. Now you can see the following. This, this, this gap that opens, this interlayer, you know, due to interlayer interaction or tunneling, okay? It, this is the situation depicted when this crossing point is at an energy substantially higher than that gap that opens. But as, as I now twist the angle towards smaller and smaller angle, these Dirac cones which are separated in momentum space get closer and closer and closer. Here, there is band repulsion. A band is being pushed down, okay? So there will be an angle at which this band will get pushed down all the way to zero. That condition is called the flat band condition, okay? So, sorry, this thing doesn't work. So decreasing the twist angle leads to, you know, when this interlayer tunneling is of the same order as the energy of that crossing point, leads to this flat band condition. The flat band condition is reached at an angle called the magic angle, which, you know, this magic angle was a term coined by Bistrisser and McDonald, okay? Now, it happens at an angle which is about 1.1 degrees. Now, I should mention that there was earlier work by, by Suarez Morel and collaborators in Chile where they calculated numerically this angle and they got it a bit off, you know, 1.5 degrees, but they already mentioned the presence, the existence of these flat bands. And there was also very interesting work, experimental work by the group of Eva and Ray. They were doing STM on twisted bilayer graphene and they saw that, you know, there, there is, there is a, there, when you measure with STM at an energy corresponding to these features, there's a von Hoff singularity. They saw that the energy of that von Hoff singularity was going towards zero as the angle was decreasing. And in fact, they, in, the, in one of their data sets, they had a sample very close to the magic angle, and they saw that, that thing, those two peaks were merging. So they extrapolated, and they saw that around 1.1 degrees, those von Hoff singularities will reach zero. Okay? So there was already quite interesting, both experimental and theoretical, you know, uh, evidence that, that something would happen at 1.1 degrees. Now, this, this thing that I showed you before was, was sort of a cartoon. Let me show you an actual video of how the electronic structure varies and an actual calculation of how the electronic structure varies as you rotate, okay? So here again, we have the brillouin zones of the two graphene sheets. If you join the corners, you form the super lattice brillouin zone, okay, it's hexagonal. This because in real space, when you go towards smaller angles, your Moray wavelength becomes larger. In momentum space, your super lattice brillouin zone becomes smaller, okay? Big in real space means small in momentum space. So I'm going, you know, you see here that this is energy versus momentum. This is twist angle three degrees. Within this energy window, for three degrees, this just looks like graphene, okay? Because for three degrees, this is a relatively large angle, and you just see the six Dirac cones coming out of the corners of the super lattice brillouin zone. I'm going to play a video now. This angle is going to rotate towards smaller angles. The first thing that you're going to see is that the super lattice brillouin zone is going to decrease in size because the Moray wavelength is becoming larger. And then you will see how the energy bands get reconstructed. So let me play this video. So you see now already at Two degrees, you have modifications. Here now, this band is separated from band gaps from the upper bands. And now, you see, very flat there at around 1.1 degrees. And then it keeps evolving. Let me, let me show this video again. So, you see we have this set now this of isolated bands. At around 1.1, this thing is going to become very flat there. And then it continues evolving, okay, in a very complex manner. Yep. So, so the Berlin, the, the Moray Berlin zone doesn't behave continuously as a function of angle. Um, are you talking about commensurability or? Yeah. Yeah. So this is within the continuum model, okay? But it's true that not, uh, not all angles are commensurate. Yeah. And in that sense, you can, strictly speaking, you cannot define, you know, a band structure for a non-periodic system. Yeah. What everybody is using is a continuum model, which is the one that was introduced by McDonald, where you can see that these features, you know, there, there is, the, you know, the, you, essentially there is almost a continuum of data points and the interpolation between these, nothing happens in between, you know, those two commensurate angles, you know, you can define, you know, band structure. And so 
with the current belief that that continuing model is sufficient to understand? Okay. Yes, at least to zero and first order, yeah. So here you have, if, if you include lattice relaxation effects, this magic angle seems to be a bit closer to 1.05 degrees, although the, the specific value of, of this angle is, is continuously varying depending on you know, parameters, calculations, as, as more accurate calculations happen. It's also not 100% clear nowadays what should we call magic angle. Uh, initially, it was in the McDonald paper, it was when does the Fermi velocity reach zero at the K points, but there are many other things you may want to call magic angle which are not that. For example, perhaps it's when the bandwidth is the smallest, okay? And those two things don't happen at the same angle and, 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 and a number of other you know, criteria that one could use to define magic angle. So now let me zoom in into that, into that flat band. So it's not 100% flat, it has a little bit of dispersion, okay? But it's much, much flatter than the original graphene band structure. So now how should we think about this? Remember, so we have flat in momentum space. Yeah? So remember, when you, when you want to go from momentum space to real space, you do Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform of a flat thing is actually a highly localized thing. Yeah? So if you actually calculate where does the charge like to sit spatially when you are in that flat band, it so happens that the electrons like to sit in regions where you locally have AA stacking, where locally all of the carbon atoms are on top of each other in this twist, twisted graphene sheet. You move a little bit away from it and you go into regions where you have locally AB or BA stacking, and those are the regions where the electrons like to sit least, okay? So what we have from the point of view of where the electrons like to sit is schematically something like this. We have regions of AA stacking. Here is where the electrons like to sit, and these regions are weakly, you know, tunnel couple through regions which have AB or BA stuck in. Yeah? So in a, in a slightly more representative way, this is the AA stuck in regions where the electrons like to sit, and the distance between these sites is 13.4 nanometers. So this is now going to be our triangular in quotes fermi Hubbard lattice. Okay? And I say triangular in quotes because in reality AB and BA is not the same thing Okay, this actually took theories a little bit to figure out. So it's actually a hexagonal uh, from Hubbard lattice, again, with two sides because of the AB and BA plaquettes. So let me tell you now, you know, let me show you some data, but before I show you some data, let me uh, tell you how we fabricate our devices because it's something that people find very surprising. Yep. Mm -hmm. So if if you have so if you have an angle, then nothing matters. Okay, it's independent of that shift. That shift just adds a phase shift. Obviously, if the angle is zero, it matters a lot. If you have a shift, because it's not the same thing having AA stacking as having AB stacking. Very different electronic structure. But with a little bit of an angle, any region you know after the shift becomes you know so that you know it doesn't matter you know. If there's a local shift, it's only a phase shift in your wave function. For any, angle that's zero? for any angle other than zero, I believe that's the case. It's certainly not for small angles. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you can see this, this place, that center there is almost AA because there's a small angle. Yeah, you just move back. Yeah, yeah. It displays itself. Yeah, there may be other angles like 30 degrees or 60 degrees where it also matters, but just, just a few angles. So how do we fabricate these type of devices, okay? So it's actually surprisingly simple, you know, kind of amazing that it works. So we start with a, with a polymer, which with a polymer slide, you know, this is a glass slide, it's transparent, and a polymer which is also transparent. Yeah? Then we bring a substrate which has hexagonal boron nitride. Hexagonal boron nitride is a 2D layer material which is an ideal substrate for graphene, okay? So for the purpose of this fabrication, it only matters that it's a flat substrate, high quality substrate for graphene. So we come down with the polymer and we pick up this hexagonal boron nitride which is also uh, transparent, it's an insulator. 
Then we bring a graphene substrate, uh, sorry, a substrate which contains a single sheet of graphene, graphene in here. Yeah? This is standard, thousands of groups around the world can do this. Here comes the tricky part. What we do is we position our hexagonal boronitride and, and polymer halfway on top of the graphene sheet. Yeah? Then we come down and we pick up, we tear and pick up half of the graphene. The other half remains there. Yeah? So from the top, it looks like this. We have our substrate, which is this one. We have a glass slide. The glass slide has the polymer, the hexavalabron nitride, and half of the graphene here. The other half of the graphene is on the substrate. But because they come from the same graphene piece, these two pieces, even though they are at different heights, they are crystallographically aligned. Okay? So now we can rotate our substrate or our polymer by an angle, any angle that we want, for example, 1.1 degree, why not? And then we place it on top and we stack it. We mechanically stack it. We pick it up and then we continue nanofabrication. Yeah? And it's amazing that this process produces a super lattice which is uniform and which can define you know, what electrons can see the super lattice and define a band structure and see the physics that I'm going to show. Yep? So there are two parts of this process that make it tricky. One is just putting layers on top of each other. The other one is having exactly 1.1 degrees. As I will mention later, this is extremely sensitive to the angle. Just, just having layers on top of each other without worrying about angles, people have been able to do 10, 15 layers, okay, and still have something which behaves in a way that is reasonable. Once you have to introduce these angles, no one has done, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're trying their very strong theoretical motivation to actually do this, to pick up three with 1.1 degrees between each of the pairwise, okay, between the three layers. But no one has shown that yet, okay? I don't think it's crazy, it's just, you know, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. So for very high quality, again, this is something, you, you should think about this as you take plastic wrap and then you take another plastic wrap and put it on top. That's the picture that you get. You get wrinkles, you get bubbles, you get areas which are very flat. Traditionally, and traditionally I mean a, a few years ago, okay, the way people would get the highest mobility, the highest quality graphene devices, which now have mobilities very close actually to state of the art, Gallo-Marsenite, mobilities of the order of between one and 10 million. What you would do is you would heat up at high temperature your heterostructure just with one graphene sheet between two monolayers, between two layers of HBN, so that you could get rid of the, of the, of the dirt and, 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 and the wrinkles and everything and it would become ultra flat and very high quality. Turns out we cannot do that with twisted bilayer graphene because bilayer graphene wants to be thermodynamically AB Bernal stack by layer graphene. That's the stacking, the natural stacking in graphite. So if you heat up the samples to get rid of contaminants, etc., the two layers do zoop, rotate and it becomes zero degrees. Okay? And we've seen this happen. So we have to be a little bit careful and we cannot uh, make as, as, you know, as sophisticated cleaning procedures as uh, we used to be able with the other graphene sheets. Now in terms of flatness, when you Measure with an atomic force microscope, in the areas where it's very flat, in between other bubbles and ridges, it can be very, very, very flat. You know, like the roughness is order, you know, in the hundreds of picometers. Okay, so 0.1 angstrom or less. You know, the, the root mean square roughness of these heterostructures. So it can be very, very clean. But the mobility, also because the electrons are much heavier in these flat bands, is not nearly as high as in the state of the art graphene devices. <laughs> so, the, um, it depends. There, there are many things that can happen, but it depends whether you have theta, theta, or you have theta minus theta. Okay? So, I think we have one of the co-authors of the paper here. Barry, are you on the paper or with Andre? No? You know? Okay. I don't remember, but um, there, there is, it's actually not only for three. You can do this for any number of layers. There's a sequence of magic angles. The magic angle actually 
changes a little bit. I said before 1.1, it's actually for three is 1.5. Um, a sequence of magic angles that we make flat bands, sometimes just flat bands, sometimes flat bands connected to highly dispersive bands. And that can be interesting to have the, 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 you know, the, density, the, the, the density of states associated with a highly dispersive band nearby a flat band where electrons are very correlated. This can be quite interesting for some, for some effects. Some people believe this would increase actually TC in superconductivity very substantially. And you know, there are a variety of predictions. Okay. Sorry? How do you tear the flake? It's literally, we just put the, okay, we, we do it in a bit special way. We, we come with this polymer. It's a little bit, a, only a tiny bit more complicated than I showed. Rather than coming flat at it, what we do in reality is we come at a little bit of an angle. We sort of do like this. And you can see optically when your polymer is halfway through the graphene sheet. And when you're happy with how much you've covered, then you retract. Uh, you literally just tear it. The graphene likes to stick to the polymer more than to itself. And then you, I mean, not more than to itself, but here there is an area addition to the polymer, while there you're breaking on a line, right? So graphene is very strong, but the area, you know, the force due to the large contact area in half of the graphene makes it easy to rip it. Any other question? No? OK. So, so this is how we fabricate devices. And it's amazing that, that we can do this. By now, more than 50% of our devices, or let's say one third at least, okay, of our devices actually ha exhibit magic angle behavior. So this is the device geometry that we have. We have the, magic ang the, the twisted bilayer graphene, magic angle, or any angle that we choose. Yeah? It is encapsulated bottom and top in hexagonal boron nitride, so that we make as, as, as good you know, device as possible, as high quality device as possible. It is contacted by source and drain electrodes so that we can apply a voltage and measure a current. And we have a nearby metallic electrode which forms a parallel plate capacitor with the twisted bilayer graphene so that we can electrically change the density of electrons. So this is a field effect transistor geometry. We can electrically change the density of electrons in our magic angle graphene. For some of our devices, we also have a top electrode so that we can independently change the electric field applied to the twisted ballet graphene separately from the density of electrons in the system. So now, just a reminder, if you have just monolayer graphene, okay, the conductivity of graphene versus charge density is like this. It has this V shape. If your Fermi energy is deep in the valence band, you have lots of holes, so you conduct very well. If your Fermi energy is deep in the conduction band, you have lots of electrons, so you conduct very well. If your Fermi energy is at the charge neutrality point or at the Dirac point, you have very few charge carriers, so you conduct very poorly. So if you measure graphene's conductivity versus gate voltage or versus density, you have this V-shaped behavior. Okay? This has been measured thousands of times by many people. Let me show you now how it works or what happens for twisted by layer graphene. So I'm going to start by just choosing a device. These are actual data. Okay? I'm plotting conductivity versus density, but I'm normalizing the density by NS. NS we call the super lattice density. It's how many electrons can you put per more unit cell, okay? which, which to, to, in order to fill the bands that are isolated. It happens to be four electrons per more unit cell. Remember that four that I mentioned before. Okay? So one means four electrons per more unit cell. This is the data that you get for a device where the twist angle is you know, more than three degrees. So remember, because for three degrees, you have something that looks like graphene. The conductivity versus charge density looks V-shaped, just like for graphene, yeah? even though this is actually twisted by layer graphene. Now let's go to a device which has a twist angle of 1.8 degrees. So it's a small twist angle, but it's not yet magic. Okay? So if you go to a device which has about 1.8 degrees, this is what you see. Now, the electronic structure, you already have a set of flatter, flattish bands, not very flat, but flattish bands, separated by band gaps from the next set of bands, which means the following. Near charge neutrality, you still have direct cones. You still have like graphene, essentially. So you have this V shape. But as you put four electron or four holes per more unit cell, now you fill this band with electrons, and you have a band gap before you reach the next band. Therefore, you go through an insulating state at full filling of your Moray unit cell. If you remove of electrons or you put four holes per Moray unit cell, you reach a band gap, 
So again, you go to an insulated state, okay? So the conductivity of a small twist angle ballet graphene has this, this triple V-shape where these ones reach all the way to zero because they're insulators. Yeah? Now their origin is essentially single particle. They're affected by interactions and so on, but to zeroth order, these are single particle insulating states. In the middle, you have a good metal. Yeah? Now let's go to a device which is twisted by the magic angle. Yeah? So this is a device which has a twist angle of 1.08 degrees. Yeah? What you can see is that near charge neutrality, also V-shaped, because near charge neutrality, you're still more or less like graphene. At four electrons or four holes per molar unit cell, you have an insulator, a strong insulator behavior, stronger because now the band gap here, the single particle band gaps are larger. But look what happens when you put half as many electrons or half as many holes as you can put in the conduction and the valence band respectively. You also reach an insulated state in a region where your system should be a good metal, okay? So this insulated state at half billion of the conduction and the valence bands is actually something which was very un unusual. Yeah? So here I'm showing you actual data with real units, conductance in millisiemens and, and density of electrons in, in 10 to the 12 per centimeter square. Okay? This is the region near charge neutrality. This is four electrons or four holes per molar unit cell. This is half of it. Okay? What you can see is that there is this insulating behavior. Now, very quickly we realized that this insulating behavior was sort of anomalous. It was very strange. Yeah? One reason was that it only appeared, these insulated states only appear, and by now we have many, many more data points, it only appears in a very narrow angular range. Okay? Only when the twist angle between the two graphene sheets is sort of between 1 and 1.2 degrees, maybe 0 0.95 to 1.2 degrees. Okay? You have a device that has 1.4 degrees twist angle or 0 0.8 degrees twist angle, these insulated states are not present at all. Okay? So that was the first hint that something is, is interesting is happening. The other thing that we realized, and perhaps this was the most shocking, was that if you apply a magnetic field, and it doesn't matter if the magnetic field is applied in plane or perpendicular to the plane, but it is most surprising, this behavior, that it appears when you apply a perpendicular magnetic field, the system goes from an insulator, here and here, to a metal, okay? And this is very odd, because remember, when you have a two-dimensional electron gas and you apply a magnetic field perpendicular to it, electrons like to go in circles. So they like to localize. They don't like to conduct more. Okay? So usually when you have a two-dimensional electron gas and you have apply a perpendicular magnetic field, you go either from a metal to an insulator or from an insulator to a stronger insulator. You don't go from an insulator to a metal. That's a very strange thing to happen. Okay? However, we saw that this thing happens. Okay? It goes from an insulator to a metal. Yeah? So now, after several more experiments, and well, here you have, by the way, the, the evolution of, you know, in terms of thermal activation with magnetic field, you see that zero Tesla, this is an insulator, okay? You apply a little bit of a field, not much happens. This is the gap extracted from thermal activation. You apply a bigger and a bigger field, and this thing becomes a metal, okay? It changes the slope of the conductance versus one over temperature. And you can see here the evolution of the gap. Yeah? So after, you know, a number of experiments and so on, you know, that I don't have time to tell you about because I want to get to the superconductivity, we came up, we came up with the essential, you know, with this basic picture. Magic angle graphene which is a system which has a set of flat bands, okay? The density of states, you know, this is the entire set of flat bands, but it consists of these two bands because the charge neutrality point has zero density of states. If you position your Fermi energy either in the middle of this, Flat, uh, upper flat band or the bottom flat band, lower flat band, okay, a correlated gap appears. This correlated gap is made out of singlets. Okay? So if you apply now a magnetic field, in particular a Zeeman field, okay, the fact that I described before happens no matter what the orientation of the magnetic field is. And it happens at the same value of the magnetic field. What you do is you polarize these singlets so that you essentially close this gap here. And because you close this gap, the system starts conducting. Okay? Now, this thing that I mentioned okay, is sort of a schematic. Okay? In our paper, we were careful to call this gap you know, a correlated insulator gap. It's not like in the sense that it occurs at half filling of that flat band. Okay? But the precise details of how exactly this gap appears and what type of many body ground state is responsible for this insulated behavior, et cetera, is, is subject of very much intense you know, 
theoretical research nowadays. I should mention also that, and actually this paper has appeared already in print. I'm sorry, I didn't update the, the, the reference. Similar mod insulator, they were a bit bolder, they call it straight mod insulator work in ABC trilayer of phenol hexagonal boron nitride by the Feng Wang group at Berkeley also showed, you know, this paper was, you know, just posted a little bit after we published our results. It's a different moire heterostructure, a different moire pattern, but ABC stack trilayer graphene, rhombohedral graphene, trilayer graphene of hexagonal boron nitride also shows similar type of insulative behavior when you half fill your electron, uh, your, your bands, okay, with the electrons. So it's, it's, it's something which is, you know, beyond just magic angle graphene, it's happening in other systems too, as I will mention more tomorrow. So let me, let me now show you a little bit, uh, I'm sorry, how am I doing? on time. Is anyone keeping track? Five, ten minutes. Five, ten more minutes. Okay. There was a question? Uh, yes, you were referring to the modern state, but is this behavior also uh, interrelated to the behavior to the edge in this case? Yeah, th this, this effect happens because of interaction. Single particle physics won't give you that. Okay? So it's an interaction effect. Now, as I'm learning a bit more and more about correlated physics, I have come to learn that People have very strong opinions about what exactly is a mod insulator and, and when and how and, okay? So that's why I want to be careful and we, we were careful, we said mod-like in the sense of half filling, okay? Now, let me show you, you know, again, this set of data. You know, we were looking at this data and we were doing temperature dependence and, you know, if we, you look around the correlated insulator states for, for, for Electrons, let me remind you, this is charge neutrality. Here, we're doping with electrons, electrically. Here, we're doping with holes. We call this the correlated insulated state for electrons. This is the correlated insulated state for holes, okay? So when we were doing temperature dependence around the correlated insulated state for electrons, we didn't see too much happening in these first devices. We saw that the conductance, as you cool down, decreases. That's what you expect for an insulator, so it's okay. However, when we look around the correlated insulator state for holes, we saw that, sure, right at the insulated behavior, the conductance decreases when you cool down, but a little bit next to it, this conductance got enhanced very much as you were cooling down, okay? So this conductance enhancement, you know, we were like, hmm, when my students showed me this data, I was like, what, you know, what, what's that thing? Turns out these data were taken in a device which has a two-terminal geometry, yeah? A two-terminal geometry is very good if you're trying to look for an insulator because if your material becomes an insulator, doesn't conduct electricity, you don't care if there is a small parasitic resistance due to your contacts in series with it. However, if you want to see if something conducts very well, okay, you don't want to have any, conductance in ser any resistance in series. Yeah? So my student told me, uh, should we make four terminal devices? And I said, sure, of course we should make for terminal devices, you know? Let's see how well that thing wants to conduct, yeah? So what we did is we fabricated exact, you know, in the exact same way that we fabricated the other devices, but this time in a four terminal geometry measurement, such as the ones that, that Modi showed uh, earlier today, so that we could run a current and measure the voltage drop within the device without having any parasitic series resistance, yeah? And when we did this, so, these are, you know, a, a different device, 1.16 degrees, okay? This is a conductance in a two-terminal, first we characterize devices in a two-terminal geometry. This conductance in a two-terminal geometry versus density. You see V-shape near charge neutrality, insulated behavior at four electrons or four holes per mole unit cell. You see that something happens at two electrons and two holes per mole unit cell. These data, by the way, are with a small perpendicular magnetic field applied to it, okay? As you can see, Something happens also when you put three electrons or three holes per mole unit cell. There's a lot more things you know, that happens also at one and minus one, which I'm not telling you now, but I'll mention some things tomorrow. Okay? Now, if you remove the magnetic field, you see that not much happens around the correlated insulated state for electrons, but a lot happens around the correlated insulated state for holes. Okay? If you now switch to a four terminal geometry and you measure the actual resistance of the devices, what you see is that magic angle twisted by layer graphene superconduct, okay? The resistance below a certain temperature falls down by several orders of magnitude below our noise measurement floor, okay? These are two different devices. By now we have more than 15 devices and this has been reproduced by several groups now. 
So magic angle graphene superconducts. But now, what's interesting is that not only that superconducts, remember, we have this gate voltage that we can tune continuously the density of electrons, OK? And by the way, sorry, these are the VI curves. You know, Any check that you want to do of two-dimensional superconductivity, it clicks, OK? This is a perfect two-dimensional superconductor. You can you know, analyze this, you know, v, v, VKT, anything that you want. The thing that is nice is we can park, you know, our gate voltage in this region and now measure the resistance of function of temperature and gate voltage continuously, okay? What you can see is that for two holes per molar unit cell, we have this correlated insulated behavior. If we add a few extra holes, we have a superconducting dome. If we remove a few holes or we add a few electrons, with respect to the correlated insulated state for holes, we have another superconducting dome, okay? Now, when I saw this data, it immediately reminded me of the hundreds of times that I've seen this plot in many seminars at MIT, okay? This is the phase diagram, temperature versus doping for high temperature cuprate superconductors. For some reason, they get the axis whole doping, electron doping wrong. Let me flip it for you, you know, so that it's correct. So at zero doping, you have a correlated insulator, it's a MOT insulator. Okay? You add holes and you have a big and wide superconducting dome. You add electrons and you have a smaller superconducting dome. Now, this is a theoretical plot. In reality, in the high temperature cuprate community, in order to make such plot, in order to you know, choose different dopant concentrations, they have to grow different crystals. In fact, of different material classes because not all materials can be hold up or electron dope or not hold up in all ranges, okay? So this diagram is usually built out of discrete data points containing hundreds of growths of different crystals of different materials with different chemical impurities and disorder. We can go from here to here in 10 seconds with our gate voltage, okay? So this being able to continuously tune with the same disorder realization, okay, the density and observe this behavior was something that of course attracted a lot of attention. So now this is, you know, this is the most symmetric you know, two domes that we have seen. Most of the times we have a behavior where one of the domes is much bigger than the other one. Okay? So and in these cases, typically one of the domes has a very high TC. Uh, I'll mention what is high or what is low relative to what in a moment. So the maximum TC in this in the, when we first Publish our results was 1.7 Kelvin. By now, it's a, a little bit over 3 Kelvin. So now, because this is a two-dimensional superconductor, you can apply magnetic field to kill superconductivity. Okay, so this is a magnetic field dependence. You can do resistance versus temperature at different magnetic fields. You can apply perpendicular or in-plane magnetic fields. Again, because this is a two-dimensional superconductor, there is very little, almost no orbital effect from an in-plane field. So you can apply gigantic in-plane fields compared to usual superconductors, okay? In fact, you can do all of this continuously again because we have this density knob, okay? So you can, these are for the two devices, 1.05 degrees, 1.16 degrees. This is B perpendicular versus density. You have this correlated insulator state and you have the two superconducting domes. Now, I remember when my students showed me this data, I thought like, eh, Looks okay, but somehow this is kind of uglier compared to the other domes, you know. What is all this crap, you yeah. know? So I told them, what's all this noise, you know? Turns out it's actually not noise. If you look carefully, this thing is actually periodic, okay? What happens? If you now park your gate voltage, yeah? So if you, your system is superconducting or insulator, depending on what gate voltage I apply. So if I park my gate voltage, my Fermi energy, in between the superconducting and the insulator states, the system doesn't know what to do. Should I go superconducting or insulator? Well, it kind of does both. Okay? It segregates into islands, superconducting and insulating islands. And in fact, if you park your gate voltage there or there, and you measure your, your current bias, and you measure your critical current, you know, or, your, or your differential resistance as a function of B perpendicular, you have these Fraunhofer oscillations. Okay? Because the system is segregating itself into islands, and typically one or two islands dominate. In fact, we can model most of this behavior just by looking at a symmetric or asymmetric squid. You know, we basically get you know the basic features in the Fraunhofer patterns by looking at you know the last two insulating islands you know governing the superconducting behavior. But this was actually crucial because this showed that there is phase coherence just as an effect through your two-dimensional superconductor. Okay. 
in, in your, sometimes you can have zero resistance because of some reason, okay? It happens often that people measure zero resistance. It's not automatic that that will be superconductivity, but Josephson clears any doubts if there were any, okay? Now, this system also has an advantage with respect to other more traditional correlated systems in the sense that it is very clean because these are two graphene sheets without chemical impurities. Okay? So in fact, we can measure quantum oscillations at magnetic fields much lower than what are needed in other correlated systems. Okay? So if you measure the resistivity, here I'm showing only from charge neutrality towards the left, towards the holes, okay? But we also have them on the other side. This is just to zoom in, okay? So the resistance versus density and perpendicular magnetic field now on a large scale, okay? Going over Tesla, okay? This is the charge neutrality point. This is the correlated insulator state. It's insulator and about six Tesla, it starts to disappear the insulator. This is the single particle band gap insulator at four electrons at four holes per molar unit cell. You can see you have these features. These are Shudnikov the has oscillations happening in our system. We have many of them. The contrast in this picture is tuned to look at this, but these are actually very beautiful ones because this is higher mobility than this, but this contrast is tuned to see this. And the slope of these lines that you see in the Shudnikov the has oscillations tell you actually about the degeneracy of your Landau levels, okay? So it happens that these ones coming out of here, out of charge neutrality, and these ones which come out of the next highly dispersive band, yeah? remember this plot here, these ones come out of the highly dispersive band. This one comes out of charge neutrality in the flat band. These have fourfold degeneracy. Remember I told you these four, okay? spin and valley? So we were not terribly surprised to see four. You always see fours when you look at graphene. However, the ones that come you can see here the superconducting dome, which gets killed at small magnetic fields. The ones that come out of the correlated insulator state have a different degeneracy. They have a twofold degeneracy. And this can be reproduced now by many groups, okay? So this has several things which are interesting. First of all, the fact that you see a Landau fan diagram coming out of the correlated insulator state, that's already interesting in itself, okay? And then this has half the degeneracy that the other, you know, in the sun device, you just change the density and you have different degeneracies, it also gives you information about what type of many body ground state is, is happening here in the correlated insulator and the theorists are discussing the different options, but it constrains what type of many body ground state you can have. Well, you know, people believe also because of the behavior in the magnetic field of the correlated insulator state that this has to do with an intervalley coherent state. But, you know, again, that only constraints from a trillion possibilities to a few dozen. You know, we still have to constrain more. Now, how strong a superconductor is magic angle graphene? I'll be done in, in after this. So, usually, you know, TC in those first devices was 1.7 Kelvin. Now the largest we have is about 3 Kelvin. So you may think like, oh, what's the big deal? You know, Cupreds is 100 plus Kelvin, okay? But the way people compare how strong a super, is a superconductor is not typically by the absolute value of TC. That's, of course, very important, if, if nothing else, for applications. But people typically compare how high is TC compared to how many electrons do you have available to contribute to the superconductivity. Okay? And this is something that is typically plot in this log-log diagram called an Uemura plot. This is sort of one version of many types of Uemura plots. I took this one from this paper which is written by Uemura himself, so I guess it's okay to call it Uemura plot. So this is TC, log scale, Fermi temperature, which is density. This is density in 2D, I'm comparing 2D and 3D systems, so this is appropriately normalized to be able to compare both of them, okay? And what you can see is that there are many, you know, superconductors here, so most conventional superconductors okay, are in this corner of this diagram. So for example, take aluminum. Aluminum has a TC of one Kelvin, very similar to magic angle graphene, but it has a Fermi temperature of over 100,000 Kelvin. So aluminum has a gigantic amount of density of electrons, and given the gigantic amount of electrons that it has, it has a relatively modest critical temperature, okay? There's way too many electrons and little superconductivity. As you go towards this corner, okay, towards this band, in fact, of this diagram, you go 
more and more exotic and more unconventional type of superconductors. Yeah? Here you have, for example, the cuprates. Here you have the iron nictites. Here you have some of the, uh, the, the C60. The, orga the, the, the organics are here. Okay, sorry, the organics are here, and the heavy fermions are here. In this purple diagram, lie pretty much all of the unconventional and exotic superconductors. Okay, I even included some data for lithium six and potassium. 40, both axes, so for cold atom systems, both axes multiplied by 100 million so that they appear here, but in terms of coupling strength, they're super strong, okay? In fact, they can tune all the way through the BC, BCS crossover. So where is magic angle graphene? Magic angle graphene is there, okay? It's among the strongest coupled superconductors that we are aware of, yeah? There's only one other data point, monolayer aerosol and iodine STO, although there's a little bit of debate here exactly about what the Fermi energy of the system is. Yeah. And of course, we can tune this continuously with gate voltage, okay, which you cannot do with other systems. So, you know, many, many questions remain, okay. The one that everybody is, is asking is what is the origin of the correlated insulated state and what is the superconducting order parameter? And in case you haven't been paying attention to the archive, you know, I, I stopped uh, updating this thing only a, a month or two after, you know, our paper was published. By now, this list goes down several floors, you know. Uh, here. It's very interesting. So the first paper was by Senke Shu and Leon Balens. You know, it was two and a half weeks after we published our paper. You know, it takes two years to do experiment. It takes two weeks to do the theory. <laughs> so they, they opened the floodgates, you know, and then vroom, immediately a lot of, actually in, in, in full fairness, they knew a little bit about our results from before I, I had been in contact with them, but it's still very short. Anyway, they, they predicted a D plus ID chiral topological superconductor, and then there are all kinds of predictions, you know, with all letters of the alphabet, S, P, D, F, G. I didn't know there was H superconductors too, you know. It's, 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 it's really strange. I, I'm not gonna comment much on all of this. I just wanna point to this paper, the second paper in the archive by Volovic. So Volovic, for those of you that don't know him, is, is a very distinguished theoretical physicist. He uh, works in Finland, Helsinki, I believe. And he, he sent us also an email, you know, and he posted this paper, uh, basically said, you know, Pablo, finally someone has realized everything that I predicted, you know, which is okay. We get a lot of theory emails, emails from theorists like that. So that's not the surprising fact. The surprising fact was the following. He said, you know, for decades now, going back to the 50s, people have been measuring, there have been about one or two papers per decade. People have been measuring super high temperature superconductivity, including room temperature in graphite. So Volovic, about four years ago, before our you know, paper came out, said, you know what? All of these reports, which are not reproducible, different people, uh, data always a little bit sketchy, what they have all in common is that the graphite samples they were using were made, you know, were turbostratic graphite. Graphite where there's small angular misalignments between the graphene planes in the graphite. If you have such small angular misalignments, you're gonna have flat bands, you're gonna have strongly correlated superconductivity with very high TC, and that's why these people are measuring superconductivity at very high temperature. So, you know, when I was reading it, I was like, oh wow, oh wow, you know, this was already a few years ago. So, basically, Volovic in that paper said, finally someone has done a controlled experiment with two layers, you see, you know, flat bands and strongly coupled superconductivity. Now just get a few more layers on top and get to room temperature. Come on, get to work. You know, so you know, we'll, we'll, maybe we'll try. You know, because who knows? <laughs> who knows what will happen? So with this, you know, I, I just want to mention that you know, you can now make these magic angle devices with any two D materials, and because we have essentially. All of the condensed matter behaviors already represented in, in 2D materials families, you know, magnets, superconductors themselves, which are 2D, semiconductors, etc. We can now either introduce correlations if they were not present, like in the case of graphene, which by itself is not a very strongly correlated material, or if the interactions are already present, you will be able to modify them by magic angle twisting them, or in some cases just by using a small, you know, by twisting them by a small angle. So there are all kinds of predictions, and in the subject of the, of the, of the workshop of the, of the school, I will mention that there is a very nice marriage. I focus today for this lecture on the correlated aspects, but 
this correlated more heterostructures is a merging of you know, not only 2D materials and strongly correlated materials, but also topological condensed matter physics. Okay? It turns out that it's very interesting topological physics in the system, and they all come together here, and I think that's part of the reason why so, so many you know, theories and so many people are working on this. And I'll, yeah, thank you for your attention, and tomorrow we continue. <laughs>